Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight uh, for the uh, fourth <coughs> installment of uh, the anatomy of an insurance claim. We're going to share tips, tools, strategies with you to uh, help you through the process of claims, help you understand what, how the insurance companies look at things, what your obligations are under the policy language, what their obligations are under the po policy language. And we're going to be covering uh, uh, one, of the, one of the many topics will be a personal property, which is by far one of the hardest, most emotional claims to put together. Uh, how to prepare your inventory, we'll be talking about that. Depreciation and its meaning, we'll be talking about uh, aging, uh, aging and its meaning, uh, conditioning and its meaning, and full replacement cost benefits. My name is Reno. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague here, Ken Crown. Richard Villanueva and Kyle Hensick out back there. And we are the Greenspan Company. We've been in business since uh, 1947. Equally as important, we uh, are licensed in many, many states. We're a local Bay Area company. Uh, we're not from out of state, which, uh, which is a plus. This is our backyard, so to speak. We've been involved in probably most of the firestorms in recent history. Uh, in California, and they're becoming uh, much more prevalent. As you, as you see, there's another one starting, unfortunately. A little background on myself. Uh, I've been a public advocate for 24 years, uh, licensed in, like I said, many states. Ken has been an advocate and public adjuster for 34 years. So between the two of us, uh, not including Richard and Kyle, you've got probably almost 100 years of experience in the room. So. Uh, asking questions, we'll uh, have the answers for you. If we don't, we'll get it to you. I'll be shocked if, you, if, we, if we don't have an answer. The Q&A process, uh, question answering, uh, when, when you think of something, just raise your hand and we'll get to you. But there's going to be a microphone passed around because the questions that are asked are great and we want everybody to hear it. It'll kind of move things along faster. So just wait for a few seconds and Richard will run down the aisle and get a mic to you so everybody can hear it. Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes, like I said, on the personal property topics. We're going to be covering the dwelling, the other structures. We're going to be covering personal property, like I said, and loss of use. Those four buckets of coverage encompass uh, your, your claim. Uh, oftentimes we're asked, what is a public adjuster? And we, uh, we thought we'd put this video together. It would best explain it. When disaster strikes, the personal and financial stress can be devastating. What should you do? Your insurance company will send out an adjuster to assess the damages and determine how much you get paid. Feels like you don't have too much say in that process. Insurance companies control their claim payments to be profitable, and they employ their own adjusters to limit their financial exposure. But who's fighting for you? What if you had your very own adjuster, known as a public adjuster, an experienced insurance professional and his team working exclusively in your corner, saving you time, negotiating the optimum amount on your behalf, and lowering your stress through the complicated and confusing process of disaster recovery? That is exactly what we provide for you. The insurance company's adjuster works for the insurance company to negotiate and adjust the claim on their behalf. A public adjuster represents you to the insurance company to ensure that the claim is handled fairly, quickly, and with optimum financial resolution. Not all insurance company adjusters are required to be licensed or tested by your state. A public adjuster is licensed, bonded, and tested by your state to represent your interests only. The insurance company's adjuster is paid by the insurance company they work for. A public adjuster earns a success fee based on a percentage of the settlement or other method of compensation. Having your own public adjuster assures you of a fair fight. And most importantly, we help you get back to your life, family, or business sooner. So the next time disaster strikes, don't stress, don't wait. Call the Greenspan Company Adjusters International. We work for you. So that's what a public adjuster is. If you were to look at your claim as a pie, this is what it would look like. Uh, your biggest part of the pie here is your dwelling basic limit. Uh, 
how, and after that would be the dwelling extended limit. An extended limit we'll talk about when we get to the, the, the bucket uh, that talks about dwelling. And the way these buckets break down, it's, and you've probably seen it in your policy, there's A is your dwelling, B is other structures, C is personal property, and D is loss of use. The personal property bucket is the second largest. Replacement cost holdback, which is the uh, depreciation. We'll get into what that means and how that works. Separate structures are your um, uh, walkways, driveways, uh, any other uh, structure that's uh, not attached to your main dwelling. We're going to be talking about code upgrades right here as well. ALE means additional living expense. That's that um, D bucket. Debris removal, which is always a hot topic out here at these firestorms, and your trees a coverage right here. So that's what it would look like uh, on, on a pot. We're going to uh, jump into the personal property slide and then move back from there. How to prepare your inventory. So the insurance company wants a list of everything in the house. They've probably given you, how many people here got an advance against their personal property? Okay. And how many people here are required to make a list for, for the rest of your money? Yeah, that's, that's pretty normal. Uh, unless you're grossly underinsured, you would get the limit of the policy typically. But most people uh, would have adequate coverage and they're going to require a list. So this is what it would look like, and we'll get into each uh, section. Um, quantity would be one column the description of what it is. The better the description, the less uh, the insurance company can argue. It's very important. The, detail, the devils are in the detail. Today's replacement cost. What does it cost today to replace that item? Not what you bought it for on sale. Not what if, even if it was a gift. It it's what it costs today. Plus tax, plus delivery, plus setup. That's a true picture of what you lost. The other column would be your cost source. Where are you getting the sourcing for your cost? Because you can't just come up with pie in the sky numbers. You need to defend what you're submitting to the insurance company. There's depreciation. Uh, we're going to be talking about this a little more in detail. Ken will get into it. That brings it down to actual cash value. And then you, you get that depreciation money back once you replace. We're going to talk about this stuff in a little bit more detail. So going back one slide. Kenny, do you want to break this down? Sure. Um, personal property, in this example, uh, the base limit is $300,000. There are sublimits for your personal property for certain items, watercraft, cash. Uh, you'll also typically see jewelry, furs, firearms. Uh, and it's very confusing. Sometimes people think, oh, well, I have a jewelry limitation of $2,500. It's not covered. If I have a fire, I only get $2,500. No. A lot of these sublimits really have to do with theft, not with fire. Firearms are typically covered 100% for a fire. Jewelry, same thing, 100%. Uh, trailers and watercraft, there's usually a limitation. Business, personal property, sometimes limited under the policy for $2,500. So... When, if the adjuster asks you, well, um, did you use that all for business? And if you say yes, well, then it's limited. If you use it once in a while or 30, 40% of the time for business, I think you can make an argument that you're using it majority for personal reasons. It's not business personal property. Um, there'll be uh, scheduled items as well. If you have jewelry that's scheduled, it's typically scheduled for theft because it's limited. Moving along here, and next slide. Things that will help you list and uh, remember what you had. Keep a pad and pen with you at all times. Draw out each room one by one. Uh, visualize the drawers, closets. In your mind's eye, go through that room. Start in the top corner if there's shelves. Finish that wall. You move to the next wall, top to bottom, left to right. Uh, don't forget what was under the beds, dressers. Oftentimes I hear, we hear, that uh, stuff in the garage, I don't even use it anymore. Uh, you know, it's really kind of useless. But 
look, it's going to turn into cash now because you want to get you want to get paid for it, and it's what it costs to replace. So, you'd be amazed at how much uh, when you start capturing uh, the line items in uh, an average house that could be anywhere between 1,500 to 2,500 square feet. You probably got four, five to eight thousand line items of merchandise in that house. We accumulate stuff over the years. So don't forget what was under the bed and up in the closet and all that stuff that you think is uh, worthless. It's, uh, it's, it's yours, you had it, and you, get, you want to get paid to replace it. Uh, use family and friends. Oftentimes after these events, you get a call from uh, a, a, fr a family or friend and they want to help, uh, put them to work. Maybe they can do the research for your pricing. Uh, maybe they can take a couple of rooms, you send them an inventory, and they'll uh, look at it and kind of price it out uh, on the internet or any which way they can. So it really, really helps. You know, let me uh, just add in a few things. Um, <clears throat> family and friends. So you've got a total loss now. How do you document it? Very first thing you should look at is pictures. Any pre-loss photos that may be up on the cloud. Uh, any family or friends that you had parties that show things in the background. If you've had a recent appraisal done of the property, you may, it may show some of the items that you had, pictures, et cetera. So that, that's really important uh, in order to document it. And then if you want to go back to the previous slide. Yeah, I was going to do that. Yeah, um, we can we talk. Can about talk. depreciation. Well, before we do that, let's just talk about replacement. It's at today's price, not what you paid for it five years ago. Full retail, not on sale, tax, delivery, installation. And, and when it comes to items you know obviously it's this is a really laborious time-consuming task there are things you can group together if you've got uh, 12 t-shirts or you have uh, dress shirts but they're all about the same price you can group them together give a description however it's the expensive items that you need to separate out cocktail uh, books are a lot more expensive than a regular hardback book uh, the higher end items are the things that you want to detail out. Um, that's really important. And then we'll talk a little bit about depreciation. Yeah, so do, how many people here have had a conversation with their adjuster about depreciation? Okay, uh, let's talk about it because it's going to play a role. A replacement cost policy you guys in quiet? California, the definition in California is uh, replacement cost less depreciation equals actual cash value. So RCV means replacement cost, ACV is actual cash value. So let's take an item like a $500 item you're claiming. And everybody agrees that that $500 item is the correct replacement cost value. And it is subject to depreciation for wear and tear, age, condition, obsolescence, et cetera. And that drives that replacement cost down. So let's, for example, say they depreciate $100. So you started with 500. You've got $100 taken off, now you're at $400. You're going to get that $400. That's called the ACV, the actual cash value of that item. Under the replacement cost definition in your policy, they'll give you back that $100 once you replace the item and spend $500 or more. Any questions so far on that? Okay. So that's how it works. Now, look, they know the insurance companies are going to bank on the fact that, number one, you're probably going to forget 25, 30, 40 percent of your stuff, you just don't remember. Secondly, they know you're not going to replace every single line item that you, you lost. We'll replace the furniture, the TVs, and you know, the, the, the stuff. But all that stuff in the garage and in the closets that you don't use anymore, you're not going to replace it. They know that. So the goal for you to get that limit reached in your policy, the devil is in the details. You got to list everything out properly you got to price it properly with a defendable document behind that to show where you're sourcing the pricing so that you strip away that, um, that, that power from the insurance company to try to lower it, okay? It's, it's important to do it correctly uh, if you want to hit your limit. Now, to, get, to walk away with the limit of your policy in the personal property bucket, the number has to be above, you, and you can get there if it's done correctly and priced out correctly. And after depreciation, you want that number to be above the limit. When we're involved in a, in a claim, that's how we approach it. Uh, look, if the numbers work, they work. If, if, you, if, you don't, if you're a minimalist 
and you don't have a lot of stuff in the house, then you, know, you may not reach the limit, and that's okay, but at least you know you've gotten paid what you're, what you're entitled to. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so you want to get that number right. Um, with regards, you know, I heard the word junk earlier. That, that's a no, that's, <laughs> but that doesn't exist, that language, in public adjusting. Everything you had was worth something. Right. And if you had thing, items in the attic that maybe you didn't care about, well, you're entitled to collect replacement costs if you replace it, but certainly actual cash value. So when you list all the items in your attic and you look at your garage, I mean, sometimes garage inventories can be $100,000 or oh, more. easy, yeah. That's and true. so it's important that you list everything out to get the replacement dollars way above the 300000 because they will apply depreciation. And you typically want to be at least 25 to 35% above the limit. Now, not everyone has that kind of a claim, but you lived in your home for 30 years and you had a bunch of kids, it's not that hard to have a four or $500,000 inventory loss. Yeah. Should we talk about depreciation and use and condition? Yeah, so, so back to the depreciation, how do they come up with it? Well, in California, it is not just uh, the age of the item that's taken into account, it's the condition of the item also. That's very, very critical. Because you could have something that's, uh, you know, 25 years old, but it's in excellent condition because you take care of it or it's a collector piece, whatever it might be. Uh, so that has to be considered. And that th you want to min minimize the amount of depreciation. And look, the newer the items are, the less they can depreciate. Okay. Uh, is that me doing that? No, that's good. Oh, okay. Um, so the newer the items are, the less they can depreciate. Uh, antiques, we hear a lot of people say, I have antiques, and they don't depreciate. That's true, they don't. The definition in the insurance world of an antique is 100 years or more, okay? Uh, so that's important to note. Uh, if, uh, if you have an antique or things like that, uh, they get paid on, on an actual cash value. They don't depreciate them, so it's willing buyer, willing seller. Whatever the market will bear for that item is what they will pay you, okay? So you, again, you want to document it properly. Do you want to talk about this? Sure. So, um, Let's talk about uh, use and condition and depreciation. I think that would be the, a good right example. Here? Yeah, so it's a, it's a true story. Uh, we got involved in a claim in Santa Rosa. It was about a, probably three, four, about a month after the loss. Elderly couple in their early 70s. Kids were out of the home. They're being pushed and rushed to get their inventory in. You know, everyone wants to get the Don't rush it. Make sure that whatever you submit, it's the appropriate replacement cost. They didn't know any better. Some of the prices they used were original prices from five, ten years ago. And they put the ages. And they had bed sets that were 25 years old, 30 years old. Their furniture was in 15 to 20 years old. Except they didn't put what's called use and condition. And they undervalued it. Nationwide on a $240,000 claim, and this was a 4,000 square foot home, was the inventory should have been at $600,000 at replacement. Nationwide comes back and they depreciate overall 55%. And we get involved and they said, look, they rushed us, we didn't know any better. And so we start asking questions. Most important question. When's the last time someone slept in that bed that's 25 years old? Oh, about 24 years ago. <laughs> so the inventory, the depreciation after we got involved went down to around 25%. And of course, the replacement pricing went way up. So it's important. And everyone, it's based on your lifestyle. My wife, she's got clothes that are in the closet, some of them are three, four years old, the tag's still on it, never been worn. That's new. That's a new item. Mattresses have never been slept on, or only one or two times. Relatively new, five, ten percent depreciation. So it's, it's real important that you address use and condition. And if it's hardly used, the depreciation should be very minimal. And you need to address that when you submit your inventories. It's not age and useful life. It's use and condition. Does everyone get that? 
and that part is very negotiable. You know, it's, it's subjective. I mean, the adjusters don't know uh, the condition of it. You do. You know, and, and, and it's, it's important to be fair and accurate, and that's how you get those numbers to, to where they need to be. It's, it's, uh, it's critical. And every, by the way, if you have an inventory, and we'll pass one around, have we passed one yeah, around? Yeah, sure. We're going to pass around what an inventory actually looks like. Uh, it's one of our work products, but it'll give you an idea of what you're expected to do uh, uh, to uh, properly collect. And you'll see on the back of these uh, books, we'll, they'll pass them around, uh, there's uh, uh, a specimen copies of where we're sourcing the pricing so that it's defendable. Okay. Uh, so every line item, if you can imagine you do an inventory, it takes you, whatever, a couple months, uh, hundreds of hours, you finally get the list done, uh, and now every line item has to be depreciated separately. Okay, so that's why if you have three line items here, that's why we have three different depreciations. And it adds up. We're really harping on it because it really makes a difference on, on getting the number uh, uh, minimized so that you can get to your limit properly. That everyone realize that, <clears throat> you know, there's going to be depreciation. Maybe overall it's only 30%, but if you're... If you're at 300000 and it's 30%, you're now down to $210,000 on an actual cash value basis. And now you have to then deal with submitting receipts. And most people only replace about 30 to 35% of what they had. The insurance company knows that. So, oh, don't worry, we'll, you know, we'll pay you when you replace it. Well, you're not going to replace everything. So that's why it's important to get the number up as high as possible based on what you had at today's prices, not on sale, and then negotiate as minimum amount of depreciation as possible. Look, it doesn't make them bad people. It's just the, the, the business mechanism of insurance. Um, you got to understand how that policy works and how it responds to your loss. Okay, that's, that's why we're here, to share that information with you. Uh, any questions on depreciation specifically? Ah, oh, it's an easy crowd. All right. <laughs> uh, so we talked about actual cash value, and that's what that after depreciation, that's that money you get. Now, by the way, if you've gotten an advance against your personal property, it could be 30%, some companies are paying 60%, it's all over the map. Some are paying 50%. Um, when you do your inventory, it starts from dollar one, folks. It starts from the first dollar. So you gotta get to that, that, that uh, advance and now you're at that advanced number, and then you have to keep going to get the balance. Okay, so let me, let me explain what, what Reno's meaning. So let's assume you got a 50% advance or even a 75% advance, and you go out and you start replacing items. That doesn't mean they pay you the depreciation because they just gave you an advance. You have to still put the entire claim together for submission purposes. If you want to get any more money than that 50% advance or 75% advance. So look, what you don't want to do is get into this cat and mouse game with them. So you, you replace five shirts or five jeans, whatever it is, and you submit and then they say, hey, you know, you, you, it's not matching or uh, you know, we'll pay you back on the two shirts. It'll take, you lose a hair on your head and, and it'll take years off your life. So you don't want to do that. The goal is to max out the policy benefits if you can by doing it correctly. Uh, that's how that works, that actual cash value and withheld depreciation. I want to talk about um, uh, the, this column right here. So when you list something out, it's not just a white shirt. It's a white silk shirt or a cotton shirt. It's a, uh, it's a Robert Graham. It's a, whatever it is, it's important because it matters. And that's the, the more, again, the more details you hit them with, the less they can argue. Okay, when you're vague to the insurance company, you get, it's, it's easy to, to, uh, to uh, not be able to negotiate with that because it's just being too vague. So that's really important, doing it correctly with the description. And then, of course, the quantity. Uh, we talked about how many are there. How many people here started their list? How many people here are almost done with their list? Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> really? Your full-time job? Yes. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it is a full-time job. It takes us, like when we're handling a case, uh, if it makes sense to get involved with a client, we take it over. It's, it, it's a team of people. Uh, it's not, not only sitting down with you and helping you recreate what was in there room for room, item for item, 
but it's also then sending it out to the sourcing department and they do the research of what that item does cost today. Uh, and then it goes to the age and conditioning department. So there's a team of maybe three to six people involved in handling a, an inventory. Mike's coming down. On one second. We have a question here. Hi. Okay, okay question. Hmm? Um, I had a lot of clothes, like okay. a lot of jeans that were like a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars for jeans. Mm -hmm. I had shoes that, well, he just found some receipts that I, I buy them like two pair at a time okay. because I like, I like them and so I like to stash them. Sure. So how do I prove that if I don't have receipts? I have receipts for some, but I don't have receipts for everything and I'm never gonna remember everything that I have. Can I just say like 10 pair of Miss Me jeans or okay. you know something? Great question. Um, you have to be accurate. You don't wanna lie. You don't want to create a fraud situation because look, your claims, they get audited. As they go up the chain of command there at the insurance company, they, they may pull it and start auditing. Uh, do you want to talk about, uh, we're talking about this issue about uh, when she you, you don't have the original receipts, they burned right. in the fire, you're worried. Now I'm, you know, carriers for the most part, the Oakland firestorm, that came up a little bit. Um, and then there was a lot of fuss raised because how do you document something when everything was burned, your receipts were burned? Uh, I don't think that's an issue. What you want to be concerned about documenting is what you had. They realize you're not going to have receipts. Now, if you had a diamond ring and it was a $25,000 ring, you know, I could see them saying, hey, do you have an appraisal that was done? What about even repairs that were made, cleanings that were made? So there are ways to document things. It's the stuff that stands out. I wouldn't worry about well, the clothing, except for one thing I would be aware of, that when you put down like ages for items, and if you say everything was, was purchased in the last two years, and you've got a claim that's a half a million dollars or more, and your income per year is only $50,000 a year, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. So that's, unless you've been, uh, unless your parents or someone's given you all the items. I would imagine, this is my thought anyway, that we have a lot of receipts that we're able to dig up. Mm -hmm. We have been able to dig up some receipts. So uh, my thoughts are, are this, that we have a lot of receipts documenting what we did purchase and that we purchased some things on a high-end scale. Mm -hmm. So I would think that then when we don't have receipts for things, then they recognize that we didn't buy them at the well, corner of 7-Eleven. Here's the million dollar question. Do you absolutely need receipts to get paid? No. No, you don't. No. Nowhere in the policy does it say you, you won't get paid unless you provide a receipt. You and by to, the way, it's irrelevant, quite yeah. frankly, because if you bought a, a, a couch for you know, $1,500 six years ago, but today it's $2,300. Re today's replacement cost is $2,300. If you submit the receipt for, for $1,500, they'll start there and then depreciate it. Now you're going to get $600. Bucks. The re what the receipts? You get it? Yeah. Understand? Yeah. That's the key. You yeah, want you it at today's that. prices. You want today. it today. That's what the policy is. Yeah. That's what replacement cost is. Now, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Now, excuse me for one. The receipts what they will do is they will help you remind yourself of what you had so for example if you buy on amazon i think amazon will print out your last five years of purchases but what's you know the issue with that is if you're arguing that it should be full retail but everything you bought was on sale at amazon it makes a little tougher argument i'm not saying you can't collect full retail i think you can but just be aware that when you turn over those receipts, that issue may come up. But certainly it helps. And I don't think you need to turn in the receipts. You can pull the receipts out from Amazon just to list everything that you had and price it at full retail. Yeah, or a registry if you were registered somewhere. Uh, things like that help. Um, and, and look, how many people here are working with an outside vendor uh, doing the inventory? The insurance wow, really? company sometimes, like AAA, I think, is using national vendor. Uh, it's, in, in it's, the insurance, it's the insurance company's answer because their adjusters are too busy and you're working with their inventory specialists. So no one here is working with a... With a you are, you are? Okay. All right. So keep in mind, like, did, they, did you ever talk about pricing? Who's going to price it? Are you going to let them do it? 
Of course. <laughs> They'd love to do it. <laughs> The, yeah. Look, don't mistake friendliness for a friend. This is business. This is a lot of hundreds of thousands of dollars is your claim. And you get one shot to do it right, guys. So if you're going to let a third-party vendor, meaning some outside carrier, uh, some outside company that sits down with you and helps you create the list, and then you allow them to price it, you're done. How are you going to come back and say, no, that's, you don't want to start doing that. You want to be proactive, not reactive. That's unless you unless you decide to let the IRS do your return for you, it's, <laughs> it's the, the same, same scenario here. Yeah. So so really important. Don't just get into the grinder of insurance and just let them. You know, look. It says it in your policy that in the event of a loss, it's your duty to tell them what they owe you. They have no duty to perform. and they're all busy with other claims right. so uh, they had to bring in a third party mm -hmm. so what do you do in that case? if you that's a good question if you have the assistance and it makes sense to you to get assistance from this third party and they can help you put it together I wouldn't just let them price it you're gonna price it you got to price it it's look it's your money they're holding it the insurance company's holding your money that's your duty to get your job to get it out look there's no law in any of the states that mandates that an insurance company be accurate on their offer it's simply an opinion of what they want to pay you, okay? Because they have no duty to perform. They don't have to. They're giving you an advance. Eh, that's okay. Question? Yeah, so uh, when you think about replacement costs and you think about the fact that they're grinding away, looking online, mm -hmm. uh, we live here in Reading. We've got a limited amount of retail stores. Uh, we shop at Home Depot or wherever. Local. Right, local. I would think that it costs more for us to replace things than shopping online. Good point. So not everybody's an online shopper. So the, if you can imagine a cubicle farm, big office complex, cubicle, and there's just, everybody's in there looking for the pricing on your list, cheaper. Because they, they only owe you the cheapest one. So if you're submitting a, uh, so and, they, and then they can cost source it from directbuy.com out of Oklahoma. You don't shop on direct buy. You go down to your local furniture store. Okay, you shop locally. That's important. That's you have to show them a buying trend that supports the document. This is where I shop. I shop here. I shop there. And if they start seeing that, that that buying trend and 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 where that would show up is in this column right here, the cost source. We got to change this slide. It's too. Uh, it's laborious for me. There you go. So the cost sourcing. That's that, that area of your claim, and you'll see it in that book that we're passing around. There's a column there. That starts to create a, a picture, a narrative of the way you shop, the way you live. Okay? If you leave it up to them, yeah. they don't know. They're gonna just they'll price it as cheaply as they can. Doesn't make them bad people, folks. It's just insurance. It's business. Big difference between, you know, obviously a Macy's and a Kmart and, sure. and where you shop. And, and you're right. A lot of people don't shop on the Internet. Uh, or you want to buy an appliance, not have it shipped. You want to be able to buy it locally at Costco so you could return it. So here's a thing that a lot of people forget. Warranties. It's part of the replacement price. The furniture you buy, you have a protective warranty. You've had a certain spray put on to may cost you an extra $200. Same thing with your appliances. If, if it came with a warranty, you're entitled to be purchased to uh, collect for that warranty. That's a good point. That adds up. I, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point uh, Ken makes. You know, they offer you the extended warranty. Everybody, <laughs> you can buy a pencil. And would you like an extended warranty? So the problem is, if you do buy that, you're entitled to that. So don't forget that. That's that, that adds up. That really and One more thing is mileage. Uh, what if you've got to drive 100 miles to get it because it's only at one particular store? Put that in. Sacramento, for instance, yeah. yeah. You get more of a selection for retail and you make your trip down there. Yeah, that's a good point too, Kenny. Any questions on inventory and how, how, how it works? Yeah, we have a question. Sales tax, when do we include that? Is that weighted at the you, end? You put that in. You're in Oh God, this is such a, we used to have so many arguments with State Farm and other okay. carriers, and it used to be they wouldn't pay it. They'd say, oh, well, we pay it when you replace. So, but the actual cash value is based on replacement, less depreciation. 
Most of the companies are now complying. And so what happens is you can either do it on, like our inventory does it each line item. We, get a, we price it and then we add sales tax. And then depreciation is based on the replacement cost with sales tax. The other way to do it is you just have a replacement cost. You have an ACV. At the end, you total the ACV and you add in sales tax. But it always includes sales tax. The sales tax, though, is based on the ACV total or it's based on the replacement total less depreciation. Does that make sense? Well, you can do it, you can apply it one of two ways. You either, on this example, you have the replacement costs. Uh, uh -huh. Let's go back to, yeah, so it's $100, uh, the first line item. Well, on our inventory, we'll have $100 plus sales tax, total replacement costs, and then depreciation is applied. So the ACV includes it. If you don't add sales tax to the replacement cost, you can total up your ACV amount and add sales tax. It's the same end. thing. We got a mic coming over. By the way, we have an inventory primer outside. It's actually copywritten. And it, it tells you about how to go about not just doing the inventory, but letting the insurance company know. It's kind of like a storyline. You want the insurance company to know. Like today we spoke to, to someone and he's a pretty successful guy. He is a avid rider. He had probably almost $100,000 of just sporting goods. He had carbon fiber bicycles. He's part of the bicycle, he's the president of the bicycle club. And you know, he has a story and that's what you want to do. The hobbies that you have, because that's where your money's going to be. It's what you enjoy doing. So you want to let the insurance company know about that. You have a question? Yeah. Um, a lot of my doctors lost their homes. Um, one of them was a car collector. And let's say, for example, if you had a, a Ford Mustang Cobra that was worth 60 grand and you said, okay, uh, would they depreciate that, or would they? Would you go out and buy another one, even if it cost instead of sixty grand, it now costs eighty grand? Would this, is that cost replacement? Well, kind of like an example. First of all, uh, that wouldn't be covered under a homeowner's policy. You have to have a separate insurance policy under an auto. Uh huh. And the way auto policies work, and again, that's not what we handle, but they pay you the market value. What that used. Mustang Cobra would run based on the the age of it and what the market is because right. there are markets for that So I guess a better well yeah. Personal well, okay, then okay. Let's say you had a, a Riding a garden tractor lawnmower That's And a you had different. it f and, and you've had it for like five years and you paid 2000 for it and now to replace that they'll depreciate it if you don't buy another one but if you buy another one and it costs three thousand instead of two thousand, they'll cover the three thousand. Yes, but here's the here's the caveat. So, and by the way, that's covered. Uh, ATVs used to service the property are typically covered under a homeowner's policy. Let me just jump in. So, motorized land. The language is motorized land vehicles are excluded. That goes back to the Cobra question. Except. If they're if used to service, service the, the property, right. they're typically covered. And again, every policy is different. State Farm will cover it if it's used to service the property. So if you, if you got mini bikes and, you know, but you got a lot of acreage, we had a client who said, look, I, I'm not going to walk all, you know, all the way down to nail that fence. I take my little mini bike and I drive down with a shovel and, I use it. So there are ways to get around it, but here's what you do. You price it brand new. Even if that uh, tractor is five years old, right. you're entitled for the cost to get a new one, but only the one that you had. So well, what if the model's discontinued? If the you model's discontinued, you get something that's comparable and, you know, no different than, than TVs. You know, the truth is they become obsolete. So if you had a TV, and unfortunately with TVs, they actually go down in value over the last five years, but you'd get the most comparable one. It may be even better than what you had because of technology, but that's how you would price it. 
And then the depreciation is based not so much on the age, but the condition it was in. If it was a tractor and you only, you, you didn't use it every week or every other day, you only used it once in a while, then obviously uh, the depreciation should be less than what it would normally be. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, uh, I, I'm a little confused about replacement cost. If you, like you said, if you buy it, it they don't, they give you back the depreciation. Yeah, so, so let's use the, the tractor, for example, $3,000 right. to right. replace it. Okay, you bought one for $2,000, had it for a few years, you wanna get paid, but now it's 3000 So the way it would look on your inventory is $3,000 for this tractor, it's comparable. Less depreciation, let's say depreciation's $500. You're gonna get that 2500 Okay, so they'll still depreciate it a little bit. Of course. Okay. Based on its Until condition. you replace. And then, and then, so they're holding back that $500. Oh, well, that's what I'm saying, is yeah. that you'll get the, the three, they'll, you'll get reimbursed for the 3000 or the extra $500 it. that that's they right. kept. Yeah, so, okay. so they'll, they'll give you that. That's called a hold back. They're holding it. Until you buy it. Until you buy it. When you buy it and you submit that receipt, they give you the 500 back. So let's, let's take that example, because this is what people don't, aren't aware of. So, you know, Reno mentioned about the importance of documenting it. So you've got a leather sofa or you've got a, a nice living room sofa, but it had scroll legs. It's solid wood, hard to find furniture now with solid wood. And it had ornamentation. So obviously that's gonna be more expensive than just a sofa. The sofa had tucked cushions. So when you go out and you price that, maybe on sale, <laughs> or it's only 4,000, but full retail, it's 6,000. Then you add the protective warranty, and that's another $600. And then you add in your tax, you're up to $7,000. And that sofa is a replacement, 7,000. And we go back and forth, and we justify that the depreciation should only be 15%. So on that example, it'd be roughly 7,000 going to be a roughly thousand dollars in depreciation you get a payment for six thousand dollars you go out and replace that sofa but guess what it's on sale and it's now only it's 25 percent less you don't turn in the receipt you keep that six thousand dollars the idea behind the inventory is to get all of your dollars paid you don't want to deal with receipts, et cetera, unless, unless you haven't hit your limit. And then you'll keep the receipts for the appliances, for the major furniture pieces. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself nuts <laughs> trying to turn in receipt for here, receipt for there. Yeah, that'll take years off your life. You don't get into the, I call it the cat and mouse game with the insurance company. It's just the way it works. That's how, that's, that's how replacement costs works. And a lot of people we hear say, hey, I got replacement costs. They're going to pay me replacement costs. Well, don't forget, folks, there's depreciation. There. Misnomer. Yeah. All right, so we're going to, any questions on uh, personal property? Yes, right over here, Kyle. Got a mic coming over. What's the time frame for settlements when they're trying to uh, pressure, pressure the client to, to perform. You know, do this? Is there a mandate or anything for Great question. Settlement? Um, so normally, once you, get an, once you get an advance, the Department of Insurance regs, it's normally not in a firestorm one year. In a firestorm, it's two years. And we had this issue come up in Santa Rosa. The Department of Insurance just says two years within the date of an ACV advance. So people were getting initially you know, a couple days after the fire, five or $10,000, and then they got like 30%. And then, of course, the clock's ticking. Well, anyone knows about what's really going on in Santa Rosa? Most people are not going to have their homes built in two years, not even close. It's bad. So then you run into an issue. Well, how am I going to replace my contents when I don't have a house to put it in? So we've been arguing with the carriers that it should be two years from the date of an undisputed actual cash value payment. You put your claim together three months, six months later, you get an agreed or at least an undisputed payment. You're in dispute, but they've paid the majority of the ACV. I think then that's when the two-year period begins. And by the way, even if they say it begins earlier, you can ask for extensions. 
I've got a client in Los Altos Hills, PG&E, three months before they'll put the gas in because they're so busy. House is done. He can't move in. We ask for an extension. So you can get extensions. Does that help? Good. Another question here and down here as well, Kyle, when you're done with that one. Thank you. This has something to do with, uh, with Rex's question a second ago. We turned our claim in <coughs> yesterday. It's about inventory. And the inventory claim. It's about as thick as the book that you guys are passing around. Good for you. We got State Farm, okay? We got a call this afternoon, and the adjuster that we've had down here has really been working well with us, and he's frustrated as the Dickens right now. He said that it's going to go to somebody called a large claim contents processing individual. Okay. I know you guys are laughing because I, I got a know pretty good this idea. It's called stonewalling, okay? Mm -hmm. So what are we looking at in terms of a time frame with that? They, they told him and came back 90 days. Is, that, is yep. that realistic or is that just something that they're saying? Well, 90 days is going to be the minimum. Okay, how's that? Uh, so here's what happens. And I've got Kyle and I have some losses in Big Sur from over two years ago. And, you know, I went through four or five different adjusters on one loss. That will happen here. Your adjuster that you have, two months from now, they're going to be gone or less. A lot of them are out of state. The State Farm people, every six weeks. Santa Rosa, I think some of the people, you know, went through six adjusters with State Farm. They'll send it to, they're going to send it to a center, Indiana, Alabama, wherever, and it's going to take a long time. And then you'll get back and they'll depreciate everything down much more. But first of all, how, how far over are you on your limits? I'll, if they depreciate it 50%, we'll take the check. Because you'll still be at we're, your we're, limit? We're more than double of what our, our policy oh. coverage is. Okay, good. They good. depreciate 50%, and we'll be happy to have the money. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that, that means you, you were underinsured, obviously. And yeah. Okay, that's a shame. But, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be three, four months. Now, because you're so far above the limit, they may speed it up. Um, I would find out the name of the large loss personal property adjuster. Talk to them. And then after you talk to them, we can, we can get into, like, what you should be doing. Obviously, everyone knows, ask for a certified copy of your policy of insurance. Oh, yeah, I know, oh, I know. Kyle. Yeah. yeah. Hold on, wait. We got somebody coming over. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, you want to you want to get a certified copy of your policy of insurance. You know, sometimes there's endorsements that provide more coverage, especially with regards to the building coverage. That's mm -hmm. important. Um, you want to document everything that you have conversation-wise. Send an email. In your example, I would reach out to that large loss adjuster. Hey, you know, my claim's a little different. I'm 100% above my limit. I was underinsured. Can you get this process a little quicker? You haven't gotten it yet? They have to give it to you. Ask for it. Yeah. Who do we ask? The adjuster that you're initially dealing with. Or the person that's yeah. helped you with your inventory. And then call them. And then after you call them, get their email address and send them a confirmation email. You got to be proactive. You know, proactive is the name of the game. You got to be on top of them. That's a good point uh, Ken makes. Um, if you have a conversation with an adjuster, that needs to be memorialized. So you need an electronic paper trail, guys, because when that case, when your uh, claim gets reassigned and then reassigned again, and there's no record for that second, third, and fourth adjuster, you're done. You're, you're looking at months of, 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 of heartache. So if you have a conversation, basically memorialize it right after you hang up. My understanding about today's conversation is bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Please confirm. That way you get a confirm, done. So now you get a record of that conversation. We've got two questions, one there. Is it illegal to record the conversation? Uh, you'd have to, I don't know. You have, to get, the, you have yeah. to get their permission technically by law, I think, right. in California. You can ask, can I record it? And they say, no, you can't. If they say yes, then obviously record it. Yeah. Getting back to State Farm, by the way, and I don't, hopefully they won't do that to you, but 
Kyle and I had some losses in Big Sur and, you know, we got, or even a regular fire, we'd submit an inventory and it wasn't even a total loss and they'd come back 30, 40% less in pricing and then another 40% more for depreciation. So, yeah. you know, it may not happen here because you're so far over, but, but be aware that could happen. I just want to address it and then we'll get to your question. Regarding recording the conversation, the problem with that is that it's not in the corporate system. So if you have an electronic email and that guy goes or girl goes to another job and quits your job, or you have the company email database has it in the system, not, not to record it. So I think that's a, yes. You know, yeah, I would definitely. Hey, he's like Reno. <laughs> that's me. I'm originally from Boston. That's funny. <laughs> Did you tell him? You didn't tell him your story. How you got into public adjusting? Well, let me answer this question. Uh, <laughs> it's not about me here. Okay, so how often should you meet with your uh, contents adjuster? As often as you can. It's up. That's uh, it's a good question. How often do do we, it's up to you. Your schedule. Look, we've had cases where you you say today I'm going to spend six hours on my contents with this person, and you're going through the house. And then you get to that sentimental area of the house and you glaze over, you're done. Lights out. So you reschedule. It happens, folks. Personal property is personal. Mm -hmm. Okay? It does happen. But you have two years to, to do the claim, the contents? Or? From, from as long, with good cause, from oh. the date of the undisputed actual cash value payment. Okay. Because she is uh, giving us for each room that we complete, we agree on a price and then she automatically puts it into our checking. That so could pose a problem. Uh, is the re who's doing the pricing? Is it fair and accurate? So what they're doing is they're kind of rushing you along. You know, hey, this room's done. Price it out. I'm going to pay you. You're done. That room's paid. Yeah. So you can't go back, though. You, you sure can. I would. Just say, well, hey, you know what, don't, and look, I'm hearing this a lot, as you but, are. But the way you're doing it, it makes it harder to go back. Right. It, who, who's your insurance? Allstate. Allstate. Tough. Allstate's so, tough. I mean, you can do it that way, but then you'll run into a problem. What if, for whatever reason, you undervalued it, or she undervalued it, and your limits are three, four hundred, let's say they're three hundred thousand dollars, and the overall value is only two fifty. And, you know, I would be the one valuing it or, or getting an idea ahead of time before you get into those discussions. So go ahead and do the entire house and then... Yeah, you yeah. have the work product that's complete and then it gives you time to digest it, to go back and re-look at it, recap it and say, I think I missed something here. Th this is a strategy. Look, don't let them rush you, folks. Bottom line, don't let... You've lost everything. They go home. So take your time, do it right. Again, unless you're grossly underinsured, and it sounds like that was a case in your, your case back there, uh, that's different. But it, I wouldn't do it that way personally. Like, okay, well, like this time um, I came back and I said, well, you know, I've been writing down things I forgot. And she said, at the end of this, we'll do a forget me, forget, you know, sheet. Mm -hmm. And she said that they can do it. You can add way. it on later. Oh, that's uh -huh. good. Like a supplemental. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, okay. and some of the carriers will do that. I just think that, you know, if it, so if it takes you an extra month to get it right, but it gets you another $100,000, it's worth the extra month. Yeah, so what yeah. should we do? Because we've been paid for two rooms now. Well, you got a few more rooms to do. Yeah. So just, you know, take those, f two, those rooms that you got paid and recap it. Look at it a little more critically. On and see who's, I, again, I would not allow them to price it for you. Yeah. I would not allow it to, uh, them to price it. We have a question here? Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Go ahead. When you're, when you're uh, doing an inventory, you know, that's going to be far um, in the past from when you actually go and buy something. So you had a couch for, <clears throat> excuse me, $2,000. Uh, you price it out today, it's $3,000. Mm -hmm. um, and they do the depreciation and give you the ACV. Um, but then a year from now, your house is rebuilt. And you go to get that couch, and now it's five thousand dollars. Are they gonna make up the difference then? So, okay, good, great question. Great question. So, first of all, you, we, or whomever didn't price it right to begin with. 
if it's a year or two years from now, it's not going to be two, 250% more. But I'm just saying, so, but here's the example. Let's assume you priced it and, you know, they don't make it anymore. And it's, or you didn't price it properly. Yes, you can go back and make claim for it. As long as you can prove that it's not an upgrade. See, that's the thing. When you replace something and it's agreed that it's $5,000, but now it's $7,500, but it's $7,500 because it's a better than what you had. It's been upgraded. They don't owe for that. But if you didn't price it properly to begin with or something has caused it to go up in value, you can make claim for that. Any other questions on personal property? Yes, right here. Right Mike. Then we'll be right there. <clears throat> These are great questions, by the way. Keep them coming. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get out with pictures. So do you share those pictures with the in, with the adjuster do you like you know put it on a thumb uh, drive yeah. a thumb drive and give it to them so they they can't weasel their way out of well you know i i wrote down what i thought you were saying but here's the picture of it absolutely the answer to that is yes yes and yes anything that supports your claim and documenting it properly is excellent that's what you want. Yeah. I'll take it a step further. One of the things that we do is, I, I do it all the time on the claims I handle, is besides having it, you know, on a thumb drive, I print them out, maybe two, three pictures per page. You've mm -hmm. seen me do it. Yeah. And I, we sit down with the insured, and we write down not just the room, but what's in it. And you'd be surprised. One, it helps you remember a lot of things. Two, it gives a, a storyline to the adjuster, and they see everything, and they see it's all listed. It just makes the claim go a lot smoother, gets it paid quicker, less doubts. Don't forget, all these claims, they're all going to the home office. You got a half a million, a million dollar claim. Mm -hmm. It's going to the home office. This adjuster has very limited authority. Yeah, they're just information gatherers, and then it goes up to corporate, and then it goes up to chain and audits. And I think there was so. a question, Reno. Yeah, somewhere. we have a question back there. I was just, so we're talking about, we both teach school, and so we're like, we'll have to take some days off to do that. Are they going to, does it depend on policy to policy? Are they going to cover any type of wage loss? Because you're going to have to be. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, they do not cover wages. Because people just take a year off <laughs> to handle their claim. You're obligated to prove your claim. Yeah, they, they don't. Unfortunately, that's a very common question. I'm losing weeks of work or days of work. They we'll don't talk cover. about additional living expenses and what can get covered. Uh, probably yeah, we'll get on the that next slide. That. So let's. I think we we're going to move on. Uh, yeah. Unless there's any other questions on personal property. Okay. Uh, and by the way, we're going to be here after. So if something comes up, and <clears throat> we're going to be here after this presentation, feel free to come up. There's four of us, and uh, ask away. And yeah. yeah, we have a question here. Here's a couple things. Um, I had some 20 by 30 canopies that I put out over my cars and my a boat and stuff like that, and um, it, they kind of got messed up a little bit. They need to be cleaned and stuff because of the ash. I don't know if there's burn marks in them or anything. And then I have patio furniture outside that got contaminated. Um, if I buy new cushions, or, and if I have to get the canopies cleaned, is um, that should be, if I replace the cushions, I can claim a, um, basically replacement cost. Right. And the canopy cleaning, that would be something. Under personal property. Personal property. Yep. yep. And, but <clears throat> the other thing is, and I know this is a little bit, and it's not your forte, but I just want to share a little bit uh, of, of what happened with my autos is that because of the contamination, uh, with the ash and everything and the smoke, I went to my insurance company and I told them the ash has gotten on my seats and this and that. And they said, go get an estimate for a detail. And I did. I had a $50 deductible on my comprehensive and they sent me a check. So you can get your cars cleaned, detailed, minus your, uh, your comprehensive. And they also uh, uh, said that you can get your cabin air filters in your cars and your air filters in your engines covered uh, uh, 
after that fifty dollar well since the fifty dollar deductible right. has already been taken off they'll pay for that too what about the duct work what about when you turn on the ac and the smell well, and the particulate that's what i was just going to say too is that in the in my house a uh, service master just came out and did a an, a, an appraisal of what the damage was mm -hmm. and the AAA guy came out and he they said that they were uh, AAA guy said we'll do clean the registers but not the AC ducts and the service master guy says that's stupid right and I, he says we can argue that point for you right. in our thing but then a AAA person called me back today and said that well we don't go by what they say and I said well to me, if I don't get my ducks cleaned, I'm going to raise holy hell. Well, they're going to recirculate particulate. Look, guys, right. by the way, your, your patio furniture, the ash and the soot is corrosive. You don't know what's out there. Uh, and when it starts to land on the metals and it sits there, it starts to pit. You'll see pitting eventually. So I would claim the whole patio set, not just the cushions. Yeah. Because it could pit. You know, if, if it shows signs of pitting. It's not pre-loss condition. And the reason I'm out of my house now and staying in a hotel is because I have, me and my son have asthma, but I have a CPAP machine, and I, I think I was talking to him about it. And I have the filters right here. Uh, I change them every two days, and they got black yeah. in them. And this is my bedroom, and even though you can't see right. the, uh, the damage in the house, right. and I know that they said, well, we can we'll wipe down the walls and clean them and all that stuff. As someone says, sometimes it needs to be sealed and painted, but I don't know if they're going to go that far. Why don't we talk to you after, because you've got some specific issues, and we'd be happy to address those. It, it, yeah, I know you. Respecting everybody's time, we've we got to kind of move it forward. Um, but, yeah, we, we'd love to talk to you about some solutions, some ideas and strategies. So we're going to move over to bucket A. Remember, we got A, B, C, and D. We've been talking about bucket C, which is personal property. We're now going to move to the big bucket, the meat and potatoes, I call it. Coverage A. Uh, dwelling. So we're going to use this 400000 as a base limit. How many people here know what extended replacement cost endorsement is? Nobody? Uh, one, two, three. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about what that means. M probably 99% of you guys have it in your policy. Really important to know how it works. Debris removal. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Landscaping. Uh, like I just said, extended replacement costs and then the additional increase uh, some policies have uh, additional uh, monies. As a matter of fact, I met a woman two days ago who had this. In a declared disaster zone, uh, the policy kicks up the extended replacement cost not only in A, but B, other structures, personal property, and loss of use. Policy almost doubled, which is great, and she needed it. So, uh, so Ken, you want to jump in here? Sure. Uh, oops, sorry, hold on. We're going to go one back. So there's three scenarios uh, that most people are going to fit into. One is you're not going to rebuild. You're going to cash out. I'm going to take the insurance money, and I'm going to go down and live by the beach in a bungalow. I'm just going to rent, and I'm going to live off of my insurance proceeds. Great, you can do that. That's an option. Option two, you're going to purchase a replacement uh, property, a house that's already built. You're going to go buy it in Arizona. Uh, Portland, Seattle, wherever. And the other uh, scenario we're going to talk about and you'll probably fall into is you're going to rebuild on site. Each one of these has certain uh, things that will trigger another thing. So first one, you don't rebuild. Take it away. <coughs> Base limits $400,000. And by the way, it doesn't mean you get that. You have to document your loss is, more, is equal to, if not more than $400,000. And in California, uh, when it's a total loss, they don't base settlement on replacement less depreciation. It's typically market value. So if your home is worth $400,000 before the fire, that doesn't mean you get $400,000. If it was worth $400,000 but the land is $100,000, then technically the carrier would only owe you $300,000 you'd get that $100,000 hold back once you show that the building repairs are more than 300,000, but if you're not rebuilding, you only get the market value. Okay, so let we're me give you a talk about it because yeah. it's confusing. So, so, let's, so let's do market value. Yeah, so there's two methods of, of uh, calculations that are used. Replacement cost, and the other one is the appraised value. 
Because the building is a total loss, meaning it's on the ground, it's a constructive total, the insurance company only owes what's called the appraised value. So what they'll do is they'll go out based on comps, what your property would have sold for before the fire, and they're going to strip away the land value. Okay, because in the appraisal, there's the building, the land, okay? They strip away the land value, and what's left is your building value. That's that initial check that you get. You might have gotten an advance, and while they're calculating the appraised value minus the land, you'll get that difference. That's the first payment, and they can do that. That's conforming to the policy and the regulations in California. So, so in that scenario, let's just say hypothetically the appraised value without the land is $425,000. In that scenario, you'll get the $400,000 base limit. If you have uh, debris removal coverage, which every policy has, it's typically 5%. That doesn't mean that you're limited to $20,000. If the building uh, market value is $350,000 and it costs you $25,000 or $30,000 to remove debris, you're still within that $400,000. The 5% for debris removal coverage pertains to if the loss is more than $400,000 and debris removal coverage is another $30,000, you'd get the $400,000 plus the $20,000 for debris removal. I want to jump in. So, so debris removal, how many people sign up for the Cal Recycle Program? It's a good program. Uh, in Santa Rosa, they, they use the Army Corps of Engineers because of the magnitude of the losses. So <clears throat> debris removal is part of reconstruction. So it's really built into this base limit. And when that base limit, and when it's proven that the damages are greater than that, the door opens up to the additional, quote, additional coverage of up to 5% for debris removal. Okay, so if your loss is under this 400000 they're going to calculate the debris removal as, uh, uh, in this number. Remember, it's part of reconstruction. And here's how to look at it. If you're going to remodel your kitchen, you're going to knock all the cabinets down, the sink, and, and whatever else is in the kitchen, and there's going to be a pile of debris there. Okay? You're going to remove it and install an, uh, a new kitchen. That's part of the reconstruction cost or the remodel cost. No different here. To unlock the, uh, the additional 5%, you have to you have to break through this number. Then it unlocks these other coverages. Now we're gonna get into that. Does that make sense so far? You have to unlock that coverage. It's additional coverage if needed. And most Otherwise. people here, if you do it privately, way more than $20,000. And most people, the cost to have it done is gonna exceed that extra 5%. So it makes sense to sign up yeah. or the uh, state program. Yes, and by the way, you'll never know how much it's going to cost. They don't bid it. They're going to just come out and do it. And look, it's not uncommon to see fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollar $80,000 bills. So they'll, uh, they'll, they'll take it out, you know, the, whatever's available in the policy. They'll take that, uh, uh, the, the Cal Recycle, and then the difference of state kicks in. That's how it works. Any questions? Talk about landscape? Oh, yeah. sorry. No, we're still yeah. on debris. Yeah. <laughs> we got a couple of questions. It's always a hot topic. So the state and feds pay the difference, or just the state? The state, and this, this program is state. 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 The, yeah. the federal government got involved in Santa Rosa so because there's 7,000 plus homes. Th this program is the same program that occurred in Lake County. And weed. And weed, weed uh, where the state came in. Santa Rosa was federal because it was a, a FEMA-related declared catastrophe. So we got a bid, a, a private bid to have the debris removed, and you are correct. It came in really high, yeah. and that's why we're doing the cow recycle because yeah. it makes we, could, sense. we can't yeah. cover, you know, the additional charges. Right. Yeah, it, it, it works in this case. And look, the only advantage, if you've got enough coverage, okay, for debris removal, the only advantage is that you have control. Because they're like bulls in a china closet. I mean, they come in and they're just... You know, it's not fine finish work. They're just going to go in and do what they do. So, um, so I would encourage you to be there if you can. They're supposed to call you a day before. If you can be there and you can monitor, uh, sometimes they knock over wellheads. And any additional damage that occurs in your property, you're more than likely signing off on a non-waiver. 
and they're not responsible. They're going to move it quick in put, and out. Put in Santa Rosa, it was it was they did a really good job there, and uh, you know they they mark off. You want to make sure you mark off where your septic system is, where your well system is, um, driveways. If you've got some expensive driveways, maybe it's pavers. Maybe put down some plywood. You know, if the, if the driveway is not damaged, the insurance company will pay for that to have it protected. Because obviously if it costs $1,000 to protect it, and if it's damaged, it's $25,000, then the insurance company will certainly want you to protect it. How many people here have heard the word spalling? S-P-A-L, spalling? Okay. Concrete, yes. yeah, so what it is, I'll just talk about it real quick. Uh, it's important. Spalling is when the uh, heat generated from either the debris falling onto the slab or your driveway gets so hot that it wicks out the moisture out of the concrete, rendering it brittle. It's no longer, no longer has the strength it had before. And the rebar underneath is, is bending and twisting. I mean, it gets two, 3,000 degrees, folks. So uh, look at that stuff critically. Patios, you may think you can just wash it off, but the, it's, if it's spalled, uh, you, might, you, you want to get paid to remove it. Okay, if it's not, then it's not. Uh, if, it, if you get a lot of heat that's been on it, if there's a big pile of debris there, and you, when you clear off the debris and it's black and kind of charred, then th what they typically do, if there's a question, they'll do a core sample. They'll send out an engineer, pull out a sample core out of it, test it, and they test the, uh, the, the, the strength of it. Because it's no longer able to do what it did. Yes? I think we were told that they're going to be just taking all the foundation out and, and all the driveway and patio, they're, they're going to take out all the way. concrete, okay. is what they told us. Okay, so here, here's the, the problem with, with the debris removal issues that we've seen in all the firestorms. Uh, they're going to come in and they'll remove the slab and the driveway, and, you, and they'll, they'll take a foot sometimes or more, uh, and then test it to see if the hazmats, you know, if it's clear. If it is, great. Here's the problem. If you choose to rebuild on that site, you're going you're to have to backfill. That's expensive, and you have to compact because you can't put a slab on there. So, uh, and that's not covered under your policy, right? Yeah, State Farm's a good example. I had a loss in uh, Lake County that Kyle and I were involved in, and uh, you know, like any foundation, you know how a foundation's built. You have to excavate. You have to, you know, sh put in plywood forms. Then you pour the concrete. And now you have to backfill it in and then compact it. Well, State Farm does not cover anything to do with soil, soil stability. So on that $60,000 foundation number that we had, uh, they went ahead and they pulled about $8,000 that was related to excavating, compacting, etc. So realize that when they come in to remove the soil, if it tests positive after they remove the first two or three inches of soil, they're going to remove some more. So there may be some additional costs you have to bring in new soil, and that may not be covered. Does okay. that make sense? That's important, guys, because this is money that you, you wouldn't, you're not thinking that far ahead. We deal with it every day. So we're sharing that information. So just be aware of it, uh, that that's going to exist. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? We have a question here. Did they remove? That's a great question. I don't know. That's a good question for them. I'm, I, I don't. We keep hearing that, and so they want to take out more sidewalks and more of your patio. That's a billing question. I would ask Cal Recycle, whomever is handling that. Kyle, do you have a comment? I, I would just weigh in to add that, typically speaking, Cal Recycle does not come in and take your driveways, your walkways. They typically don't take the foundations for separate structures. So your expectation should be that they're going to come in and they're going to remove the foundation of the main house. Now, they may damage some of those other ancillary you know, walkways and driveways along the way, which is why we're suggesting that if you can and you think that they're salvageable, you should do what you can to protect them because they are going to come in and drive on them and potentially damage them. Because the separate structure coverage is typically an underinsured portion of the policy in an event like this, any of those separate structures that you can save potentially, you want to make those efforts to do it because it'll free up more monies for you to put towards the other budgets. 
With the so we have a question here. How do you? How do you? Oh, hold on, hold oh, on. Sorry, we'll get right. Back. I spoke with Shasta County this morning about this, and they gave me a pretty good picture of what's going to happen. Cal Recycle will not do what the Army Corps of Engineers did down in Santa Rosa, which they they did. They took a bunch of stuff out. They were paid by the ton. They took swimming pools out. They just it was a disaster, and they went over that whole scenario with me. They will come in, and, and you can you can personally be there. They will contact you. 24 to 48 hours before they go in there. You can go there and you can be there on site and you can, as was explained a second ago, you can tape off stuff, you can mark off stuff, and you can be there and protect property that you don't want them to hurt and they're not gonna take out the kind of stuff that they did in Santa Rosa. That was explained to me in pretty good detail this morning and I feel, from baseball, I said, we. You, you can pretty much call the shots as far as yeah, it's important. patios and sidewalks and right. swimming pool decks and that sort of thing. Meaning you should be there. Yes. You should be there. That's your property. We had a question here. Um, um, yep. Who needs to go to the gym? Just <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking maybe you should just use the spray can, the orange, and sure. would you do it? on yes. what you want to save because we have plenty of brick that I don't want touched and we have a huge crepe myrtle that we all brick and I don't want that touched but right. um, oh I wanted to ask about the septics do they normally take out the septics oh nope. good good no because you just want to make sure it's marked up yeah. so that when they come in with their excavators they don't go over the and same thing with the leach lines. You want to mark up where they are. Most of the leach lines are away, but, you know, it's something to be aware of. Getting back to the slide. So no rebuild. This is what happens. You've got additional. You're entitled to additional 5%. Landscaping falls under coverage A, which is 5% uh, of your base limit. Landscaping includes trees, shrubs, and plants. it's either going to be plants, 500 or 750 up to $1,000 per tree. So for those of you that have, are sitting on you know, some good land and, and have lost trees, add them up. Usually this bucket gets maxed out. I've never seen anybody underinsured. Under and, it, and it's the cost I mean, are, not just for a new right? tree, but the cost to remove the tree. So sometimes it may cost you $500 just to remove the tree. And by the way, that doesn't mean just cutting it down. You're entitled to remove the stump too. So what ha typically happens is exactly what Reno mentioned. You're going to exhaust your limits if you're on an acre or more of land. So this is what you're, you're entitled to if you choose not to rebuild. Okay. Next. Plus so other structures. It's not on the slide, but yep. there'll be 10% for other structures. And, you know, we'll depending on the amount of damage, you get to collect that if, even if you don't rebuild. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're going to get to that slide. So scenario two. You're going to go purchase a replacement property somewhere else. Again, these benefits carry anywhere. Um, so base limit, same thing, 400000 Debris removal stays the same, right? It's additional coverage if you can prove that your damages are greater than four hundred. Landscaping stays the same. Here's what changed. You're entitled to what's called the extended replacement cost. Some policies have 25% extended replacement cost. Some have 50. Some have 75%. Some have 100. And some only have 20%. And some, some people forget to, they, or aren't aware that they can get it, and they don't have it. So, so this is really critical. This makes a huge difference. Remember that dwelling uh, in the pie we showed you, that, that's the big meat and potatoes. That's the big money claim. So if you have an extended replacement cost, the way to unlock that benefit is you have to exceed this number. Okay, remember everything's hinging on that base limit. So if it can be proven that the damages are greater than four hundred thousand after depreciation, well, no matter what, let's just use this example. Okay. So most policies, with the exception of State Farm, if it's documented that it's going to cost six hundred thousand dollars or more to rebuild your home, you'll get that extra two hundred thousand dollars in this example. But you don't get it until you either rebuild or replace. Okay, that's how it typically works. It's not replacement less depreciation. It's just going out and exercising it. State Farm, by the way, they only give you 20%, but their policy does allow you to collect the extended replacement costs up front. You don't have to replace or rebuild. 
That's the only benefit of State Farm on their policy. So one of the questions that comes up is, well, do I get it if I prove that it's 600000 or more to rebuild? No, you have to incur it. You go out and you buy a home and you spend $600,000. Do you get that extra two hundred? dollars No. It, you only get it if the home you buy without the land is equal to $600,000. Scenario three would be I go out. No, let's keep it the same. I go out and I buy a home, but with the land I only spend $550,000. But the carrier agreed that to rebuild my home the way it was, it's $600,000. You've left $50,000 on the table. Does that mean you can't get it? Not necessarily. You may decide that the home you bought doesn't have the same kitchen that you had. And you, you end up remodeling the kitchen. You spend that $50,000 that's remaining, you collect it. So you're not locked into necessarily having to buy a home you know, without the land that's $600,000 if it just so happens you can't find that house, but you find a house you like, but it's trash. And you, maybe, maybe the house you buy is only $500,000 without the land, and you've left $100,000 on the table. Maybe it's a smaller home and you want to add more square footage. As long as you expend the money on it, whether it's a rebuild and remodel or, or a, pardon me, a replacement and remodel or addition, you can collect that. Any questions so far on that? Good. Okay, so, uh, and then this line here, additional increase due to declared catastrophe. Look at your policy, folks. How many people here have ordered a certified copy of the policy? <laughs> yeah. I, I have a loss that's a year and a half old. I never got one from State Farm. Stay, who, are you State Farm? <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Uh, get a certified copy. And basically what it is, it's not the way they mail it to you. It's, it comes in from underwriting. It takes a few weeks to generate. Uh, you know, there's a, typically a stamp. There's, it's signed off that it's certified. Your policy goes from one year to the next. And within that, that year, uh, some, oftentimes they change the language of the, pol of the policy and you'll get that one pager in the, in the mail that says California endorsement change, yeah. right? And most people just you know, grab it and go, okay, whatever. And you throw it away or you put it in the drawer and file it. The problem now is there's been changes in your policy and now you're, you're, you're using your policy and you don't know what that is. So the, the certified copy will have all the current forms and endorsement changes in that policy. It's, it's the rule book. It's, for the lack of a better word, the Bible. That rule book, if you don't have it, you're not in the game. Because if the adjuster's citing something uh, or arguing a point and he's talking about a certain part of the policy and you don't have that rule book to reference, you're out of the game. Okay? Yes. Yeah. So we, we got from the insurance company, we, we got from the insurance company, <coughs> everything including the endorsements mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily certified so do i go back and say i need the underwriters certified Certif copy yes i would okay yeah. Th that by, way you by the know way the do you have an all state it's deluxe all state. plus or deluxe policy do you know what deluxe. what uh, I, I can't remember if yeah. it's deluxe or deluxe plus. yeah i mean no different with state farm Mo when it comes to all state and state farm they have one or two policies, Allstate has two, Deluxe and Deluxe Plus, and they really haven't changed. Where you run into situations are some of these other carriers. Uh, Liberty Mutual, for example, they have an extended replacement of 135%. But guess what? When you have a catastrophe, and it's a declared catastrophe, they have a special California endorsement. Right. It takes it from 135% to 180 percent. Safeco had an uh, interesting policy. Kyle and I were in Lake County and I kind of remembered it. Uh, it was a special policy. It wasn't, it wasn't in the, the policy declaration pages, but I remember that. And so we're in, Safe, we're in uh, Santa Rosa and Safeco uh, is telling people, well, you've got your you know, 150 percent. 
and we met with a gentleman and he didn't have enough money even with the 150 percent he didn't need us i said well look let me i i remember there was the same policy and i I remember we, it was doubled. I think there's a special endorsement. And sure enough, I went back to the old policy that I had from, from Lake County, and there's a special endorsement. In the event of a declared disaster, it goes from 150% to 200%. Get, get your policies, make sure it's certified, and make sure you get the endorsements. By the way, for your state farm policy, what's the FE? FE 3422. That's the endorsement number you're yeah. looking for, because they'll... they'll it opens up doors for you. It opens up not just the 20% kicker, but you get your code upgrade coverage paid even if you don't rebuild or replace. 20% of the, the base, base limit. limit. State, state Farms. Ex yes. For, no, yeah. not for, well, it's for the extended replacement. It's not other structures. It means that if it, in this example, if it costs four hundred and eighty thousand dollars or more to rebuild, you'd get your four hundred plus twenty percent more eighty thousand dollars. You get that paid. You don't have to show you rebuilt. You don't have to show you replace. You get that no matter what. Uh, and and if it's ten percent for code upgrades, which State Farm usually has, and you show that you're going to have more than forty thousand dollars of code upgrades to rebuild on site you get that paid up front as well. So Even Ken, that would be a good time to, why don't you switch to the next slide so you can sure. talk about how the code works. Good idea. So, so go ahead, Marina. So rebuilding on site, uh, if you choose this <clears throat> scenario, again, we're talking about three different scenarios you'll fall under. If you rebuild on site, <clears throat> what changed? Code. Uh, <clears throat> uh, some policies have 10%, some policies have up to 100%. You gotta read the policy. Okay, so in this example, we're using 10%, which is typically what it is. Uh, now, by the way, some policies have the code built in, and I've seen a few out here. Triple, Triple A is built into the limit. So don't think uh, for a moment that it's more than that. It's going to be part of that $400,000 limit. So in the event that you do have a policy that gives you additional coverage of 10% code, it's called ordinance of law when you're looking at the policy, and <clears throat> it's additional 40 uh, 40,000, 10% of the 400,000. Does everyone know what building ordinance and law is and how you get paid and what it covers and, and what the impact will be here and what happened in Santa Rosa? Well, let's talk about it okay. briefly. Um, <laughs> so it's any costs you incur or will incur in rebuilding your structure to take that 20 or 30 year old home and make it code compliant. So the foundation it's damaged from the fire, but it's a 30-year-old foundation. You're going to probably be required to have deeper footings, thicker footings, more rebar. It's that incremental cost. So if the foundation, to put it back the way it is, it was $50,000, but a co-compliant foundation is $75,000, then $25,000 falls under the code upgrade coverage. LED lighting energy efficient uh, HVAC, solar panels that in California now you're required to have a solar panel roof on new construction. If they require it here, which I know in Santa Rosa they, they are, the solar panels would be a code upgrade. Sprinklers, you have to sprinkler your home, that's a code upgrade. Uh, if, you, if you're out in the county and you have to have a 5,000 gallon holding tank for the sprinkler system, that's a code upgrade. So it's anything that would be required to make that building code compliant. So the code, the insurance company does not supersede the law. So if it's mandated, they have to pay it up to the limit. In this example, there's an additional 40,000. Any questions on ordinance or law coverage code? Yeah. It's built in. It's, it's Are you built AAA? Yeah. yeah it's, it's built in? Yeah, so, so in this example, let's assume your loss was more than six hundred thousand dollars just to rebuild your home the way it was right but in addition it's gonna you've got another fifty thousand dollars of code upgrades right so the rebuild to code is six hundred and fifty thousand dollars you won't get 
that extra fifty thousand because it's part of the four hundred and two hundred thousand dollars. It's not an additional amount above and beyond the limit. Most policies, it's an additional amount. AAA, it's not. It's subject to the building limit or the extended building limit. Okay. Any questions on these three scenarios? State Farm, it's an additional amount, by the way, for those people with State Farm. So if you can prove and they agree that it's going to be more than $40,000 in code upgrades, you can get paid that amount in addition to your base limit and the 20% extension. And, and the important thing to note there with State Farm is that if measured, you can collect those monies without rebuilding. So State Farm is likely the only policy written up here that allows you to be able to collect both the extended replacement cost, the 20%, and the code, up to 10%, without having to perform. Now you have to have it measured and you have to get the carrier to agree to it, but you don't have to go and buy a replacement home or rebuild in order to get the monies. Once measured and agreed upon, they should cut you the check. As long as you have that FE, uh, FE 3422. Yeah, mo and most of the policies out there, you have it. So here's what's important, because I remember uh, when I was first came up here, we, we've done some business before, and one of the gentlemen that got referred to me was telling me, well, my adjuster, my state farm adjuster from Texas was telling me that I have to incur permits and I have to uh, incur the code in order to get paid. That's not true. And the problem is you have out-of-state adjusters that aren't familiar with it. So with State Farm, it's one of the few companies out there with all the issues that they have, they have this special endorsement and it does allow you to collect the money without having to rebuild or replace. Question over here. So I, I'm a little bit confused on the building code. So as, as an example, let's say that we're on that lower end, we're maybe 10 or 20 percent, and it's going to cost us more than that to be to code. Does that extra money above and beyond our limits come out of pocket? You can use your contents money. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can shift that money any which way you want, folks. It's a bucket of money, right? Even though you have these four separate buckets getting paid at four different times, maybe you take some other structure money and make up the shortfall. Okay. Sure, you yeah. can do that. And, That's a and good question. By the way, all state, um, depending on whether you have the deluxe or deluxe plus, it's either 25% extended replacement or 50%. But the code, like AAA, it's part of that limit. It's, it's an additional amount, but if you exhaust your limits plus the 25 or plus the 50%, it's not in addition to that. Okay, so these are the three scenarios. No rebuild, purchase a replacement property elsewhere, uh, or rebuild on site. Okay. Uh, bucket B, other structures. Uh, what does it mean? Garages, workshops, detached fencing, retaining walls, et cetera. Uh, it's typically either 10 or 20% of the base limit. In this example, it's 10%, so $40,000. We find that a lot of people are typically underinsured uh, in these losses. You know, you have a workshop, you got cars, you know, big garages, things like that. So uh, you may have uh, uh, extended replacement costs. Like I said earlier, we met uh, met a woman who had uh, A, B, C, and D got kicked up because she had this. Uh, there was a declared catastrophe, and she had that endorsement in her policy. Uh, landscaping, we talked about earlier as part of the dwelling. Walkways, driveways, patios, sprinklers, exterior lighting, solar panels. Let me ask you, if you had solar panels out in the back, is that considered other structure or is it a dwelling? Anybody? Part of dwelling or other structure? Depends. Depend, I always like to answer, it depends on whether you got a shortfall on coverage in either other structure or dwelling. It, it's typically a separate structure but I've argued times where it's part of the dwelling. If I know I'm exhausting my other structures and that solar panel is integral to the house, it's what heats the house, it provides electricity, I think you could make an argument that it's part of the building. No different than the well. The well is integral. 
The septic system, it's separate, but it's integral to the building. So I'd argue that if you know you're going to have a shortfall in other structure coverage, to put it under the building coverage. Our adjuster is saying that our well house and the well itself is part of the dwelling. Good. So that's your bigger bucket. So if, they, if you can shift coverage if you need to, kind of push things into, if there's more in the dwelling, and he's putting it there, that's great. Because more than likely you'll exhaust this if you've got other structures coverage, more than likely you're probably underinsured typically. Now oftentimes uh, uh, people have called their agent, they build a, 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 a separate structure, a workshop, and they'll call their agent and get additional coverage. You can do that, uh, look at your policy. Okay, so base limit again is 40,000 in this example. She Extended replacement right cost, we talked about if you've got that special endorsement that kicks up A, B, C, and D, uh, that you want to look for. Debris removal, the debris removal, uh, you know, the debris field is your contents, it's your other structures, and it's also your dwelling, certainly. But there's a, a caveat to the debris removal on the uh, 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 other structures. Do you want to talk about that? The caveat being that it's 5% of, of the no, other No, what's it, the square footage? They won't remove oh, it? Oh, yeah, it's a hunt. All right, so a shed that's like uh, less than 120 square feet is not considered a separate struct, an other structure. It's more contents. That's the, that's the caveat. Okay. So debris removal here, you get 5% uh, of that. That's how we got this $2,000. And then code upgrade, if you build your garage back up or workshop, it needs to be brought to code, just like the dwelling. If some policies provide code upgrade coverage for other structures. Others do not. I just want to make sure, because Reno mentioned garages, that doesn't mean that if you have a garage and it's attached to your home, that's not a separate structure. Right. If your garage is separate from the house by clear space, but the roof connects, you have a walkway, that's part of your building. It's a detached garage. That's a separate structure. What about hot tubs? Is it other structure or personal property? Well, that's what they gave a test for, personal Can you pick it up and move it? Was it bolted down? It, well, it, it's all melted. They can't tell where it was now. But, it, it, but it, before the fire, could you have drained it and picked it up and moved it? Yeah, it was set in the, in the deck. We were on a hillside. It wasn't bolted, it was just placed? It's, a, yeah. it's personal property. If it's bolted down, it would have been part of the other structure if it's, or, or a dwelling. Yes. We had a conversation with our adjuster about that last night, and he asked us, our hot tub is not bolted down, but it had a dedicated electrical separate circuit, mm -hmm. and the, the wire came up, and it was right underneath the hot tub. And he said because of that, it was considered part of the dwelling. It wasn't personal property. In your case, that's, a good, that's good because you've exhausted the limit. You're way, you're way underinsured on the personal property. So he's shifting it to the building where there's more, more money to work with. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's good. I, so you're, that's a good thing in your scenario. It's kind of a gray area. You can argue all three. And that's why I always go back. It really is dependent on where your coverages are and what your shortfalls. You know, the, the whole idea is, you know, Rob from Peter to pay for Paul. It's, you know, when it comes to hot tubs, it can be a gray area. Usually, they're considered either part of the dwelling or part of the uh, other structures. Sometimes you can argue that they're part of personal property. It really depends on how it's hooked up, but I've seen it argued all three ways. And again, the idea is to make you whole for your loss. And so you, you've got shortfalls in coverage in one area, move it to the other area. Any other questions on, uh, oh, we have one here for other structures? I just, uh, what about swimming pools? That's other structures. Separate structures. Yeah, separate structures. Is it a? In ground. In ground? Yeah, it's other structure. Now, we, we had an interesting, we, we, Kyle and I just met with someone. They had an above ground wave lap pool type thing. And, you know, could that be transferred? I, I guess. I mean, it was, you know, you put it in a, big truck or trailer, but anyway, it, okay. it's, it's, it's all about being creative with the policies. That's what, that's kind of what we enjoy doing. I, in particular, it, you know, to make arguments and to, and to be able to help people out where there are shortfalls in coverage. We are going to go to bucket D, loss of use, temporary housing. 
and right here. How many people are in a permanent temporary location? How many people have, or they're not couch surfing? Or, okay. How many people are still in a hotel? RV, okay. Yeah, you, because you're a cleaning situation, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you either have a, a dollar limit in that bucket, you'll see it on your declarations page, or there'll be no dollar limit, uh, but there could be a time limit. Okay. So uh, ALE stands for additional living expense. Temporary housing pays for furniture rental costs, increased mileage. Um, this is a big one, by the way. If you're traveling uh, extensively to go back and forth or you're further away from work, uh, you, you, you want to log that mileage because you can get paid for that. It adds up, folks, to a few thousand dollars at the end of this process. There's a, an app out there called Mile IQ. Um, uh, it's $4.99. And it's a great little app. It tracks all your comings and goings at the end of the day or the week when you want. You swipe, uh, swipe right if it's business related, fire related. Swipe uh, left if it's personal. And, and it tracks everything. It gives you a total. The IRS loves that app. Uh, we use it for tax write-off, but apparently you can't do that anymore because they took that benefit away for mileage. But with your claim, I would certainly use it. It beats the old pad and pen on the pad and paper on the dashboard and having to log it. It just does it automatically. So it's a really cool little app. Thank you, Richard, for turning me on to that. Uh, so RV boat storage, uh, that's covered. Animal boarding, if you had a, a pet that uh, the hotel couldn't take for whatever reason and you had to board your pet, that's, that's covered. Uh, cats and dogs, they uh, fish they don't do. Uh, there's some, some exclusions in your policy. Question? With fish? Oh, really, huh? <laughs> the koi, you have a koi pond, is that it? We have a huge koi pond, and, and okay. animal control went out and picked them up. The first wow, interesting. Out Travelers, so. Straight to boarding. Yeah, cool. Traveler, yeah, they offered. Do they have names, the koi? <laughs> they do, don't they? <laughs> All right, so um, a dollar limit, time limit we talked about. Uh, so look at it. Now, if there's a dollar limit, let's say there's $100,000 in that policy, dollar limit, and as you know, you now have 24 months uh, uh, because it's a de declared disaster. If you exhaust that 100,000 in month 13 or 15, whatever, you're done. Okay, it doesn't matter that. Once you're done, you're done in that bucket. Okay, so you gotta look at that a little more critically. Um, wanna talk about fair rental value, Kenny? Sure. Um, there's a few policies out there. I think CIG, Ca Capital Insurance Group may offer it, certainly. AAA offers it, and it's what your home would rent for. Now, AAA won't pay for, quote, a furnished home, but the idea is your house, you, you've, it's been destroyed. You can either opt for additional living expense. Under AAA's policy, it gives you either ALE, what it would cost to rent a home with furnishings, or fair rental value. You're, and, and it makes sense to do fair rental value if you've got a large home and you're not going to rent a large home. You want to rent a small home. Maybe the house that you have in today's market, by the way, not, not necessarily fair rental value before the fire. I know that there were a lot of arguments in Santa Rosa about that, but I think it's the fair rental value of what your home would rent for after the fire. Maybe it's $3,000 a month. You could go ahead and just rent a home for $1,500 or $2,000. You still collect that $3,000. Again, though, you have to have that coverage, and there's very few policies that offer it. The other thing with fair rental value is, do they owe you for the fair rental value of your home with furnishings or without? I think they owe it for you with furnishings. Again, every carrier is different. AAA won't pay for furnishings. They'll just pay for the fair rental value of your home. And I think it's important that, you know, they'll, they'll, they never give you their best and final. Typically, we're seeing a lot of um, issues where they'll come up, they'll hire some a third party vendor to come up with this value under fair rental value. And when you look at it critically, you can challenge it. And we've seen sometimes double where yeah. they're, they're paying fifteen hundred dollars and you're like okay i'm desperate i need to but you're really entitled to three thousand a month so today, so that needs to be negotiated properly examples today kyle and i met with someone he had a forty three hundred square foot home 
with a pool, had magnificent views, and the carrier came up with roughly $4,100 for the fair rental value. And he's now looking at properties and you can't even rent them for close to that. Uh, it's almost double. So that's, fair rental value is an interesting thing because it is somewhat subjective. And if you've got that coverage, which you don't with State Farm and a lot of the other policies, but if you have that coverage, you can negotiate a fair rental value, get paid for that, maybe live somewhere else. Uh, did we talk about ALE and, and replacing or buying replacement properties or using buy No, RVs? I don't want to talk about that in the RV because yeah. I've okay. seen a lot of people are right. switching. To, we have a question here. Okay, so we had a 2,500 square foot house and mm -hmm. they wanted to put us in a 2,500 square foot house. And I said, no, you know, I just wanted two bedroom, two bath, three bedroom home. So we're, they're paying, the insurance is paying 1750 but our house, so you're saying if we were to put our house uh, up for rent, um, we would get the balance of that? No. No, so for your rental, um, so are they paying what you're actually incurring? The rent is X for, for the 17? Yeah, the 1750 they're paying, mm -hmm. but we had a bigger. You had a bigger home and you've decided to go as far. So can you collect well, so, the, so the go difference? Here, here's the thing, again, because someone was looking Standard at me living. a little. It's unless you have fair rental value, I, I call it use it or lose it coverage, you're only entitled to collect what you incur in additional living expenses. If you decide to rent a smaller home, it doesn't mean that Allstate owes you for uh, renting a comparable, they owe you to rent a comparable home, but if you opt to rent a smaller home, that's all you get paid for. Yeah. yeah. If you have additional living expenses coverage, if you have the ability under loss of use to make claim for fair rental value, then obviously it makes all the sense to claim for fair rental value, get that money, buy an RV, rent an RV, rent a smaller home. We have a, we have a couple of questions. Good. So we didn't know, I know we have additional living expenses, of course, but we must have the fair rental value because they cut me a check for four months of rent and pay, they're paying us $2,200 a month mm -hmm. and we're staying in our RV. So that means we just, that money, that extra money, we just get to keep that extra money. We don't have to show that we're spending that. I, I believe something. so, but who's your insurance company? Travelers. So they pay, they've, they've come up with a number uh -huh. and they're paying you that a month. Well, they paid, yeah, they paid, they said, they gave me 5,500 or $5,600 and told me, I think that that was for, um, that was 8,000. Oh, that's, yeah, I don't know what they gave me. They gave me, they told me it was $2,200 is what they were allowing us. Under that bucket, a month? A month. Is that a correct number? Did you ever challenge it or look at no, it? No, I think that's fair. I mean, we didn't have a mortgage, so. I mean, it has, it has, nothing to do. It has nothing to do with your mortgage, <laughs> by well, the way. I think it's, I, I, well, I, I get, we're going to be renting a house because okay. this is going to take a very long time. Sure. So if we can't rent a house for 2200 are we able to go back and, and tell them that we can't find a house for that price? Y yeah. And they yes. can pay more? But the only difference is, you're, are you in an RV right now? Yeah. Is that you're doing, or uh, do you own well, the It's RV? ours. Uh, it's the only thing we were able to leave with. We so, had it hooked up. So it's so. a fair rental value. Is it, well, travelers on? typically not, but what may happen is travelers and insurance companies, sometimes they do weird things, sometimes they do the right thing, is maybe travelers is saying, hey, you know, you're using your RV. We think that your house would rent for $2,200, and we're just going to give you this allowance. How, how many square feet was your house? 1,500. I, I, don't, I don't know. I think it's probably a little higher than that what? now because of the market rate and what's occurred. So if it's $2,700 and, and that's all you can find that's comparable, then they'll pay you that difference. But I think, yeah. too, we didn't live in a neighborhood. We'd have acreage with a swimming pool, a hot tub, property, pond. So I think what they, well, what they said to me is that they would pay for us to rent a place like what we lived in. That's right. And your if standard it's, of living. And if it's, it's your, it's, the idea is you're entitled to collect for what it would cost to maintain your normal standard of living. 
So that's to rent a comparable home with views, with a pool, with three acres, or something close to it, plus any increased mileage if you're further from work, or you're driving your kids back and forth to school and it's further, or you're checking on your property three times a week. And by the way, the mileage will add up to thousands of dollars. You know, just figure what, it, what your typical week is of additional mileage. If it's 100 miles a week, 54 cents a mile, that's $54 a week. You multiply that by 52 weeks in one year alone, you're in the $2,800 range. And it's going to be two years possibly before you get back into your homes. We've got a question here. Um, we bought a home, and the, we have the fair rental value, and they were going to give us three months to cover the motel stay that we had but the minute they found out we bought a house they stopped paying and i didn't know if that was negotiable so let, why don't you talk about that that, that so, happened quite a bit in, so uh, yeah so let's talk about the house you had versus the house you purchase so you talk purchased a replacement home correct it is a replace and it's comparable in square footage it's temporary so we can build. oh well have you explained to them that you plan to rebuild and this is not a replacement home and this is a temporary home? I don't believe that, uh, I, don't, I think you're entitled to get paid. Now, maybe what should have happened, you didn't know, is you had some discussions and say, look, we're either gonna rent a house, it's gonna cost us $3,500 a month plus furniture, or we're gonna buy a home, but." We're still incurring a cost. We've got mortgage interest, et cetera. And then before you buy it, work out an arrangement. Make sure the carrier's aware of it. You know, in Santa Rosa, a lot of people formed LLCs, bought homes and rented it to themselves, or they had discussions with the carriers or we were involved and we got them to pay for the monthly rental of what that house would rent for. Because my guess is whatever home you purchased, you'd be able to rent it at a premium right now. So you're just kind of, in a sense, running it to yourself. But you need to have a conversation right away and explain, this is not my replacement home. We are rebuilding. This is a temporary home, and you should be paid whatever that rental value should be. That's a lot of money. At the end of the, this period, yeah, you know. Yeah, two years. That's is it, yeah, there's, a thing called the period of, there's a thing called the period of restoration I want to just touch base on real quick. Uh, the period of restoration has to do with the length of time that it would take for you to either replace or rebuild uh, elsewhere. And basically what that does is the minute that they give you an undisputed amount of money or an advance in that bucket A, the dwelling, you have to move with diligence and dispatch. It says it in the policy. And if you just you know, sit around and you don't, you're not acting um, in, in a manner that you're, you're talking to realtors, you're, you're, you're talking to contractors, architects, engineers, et cetera, and it's not documented, they can shut off your loss of use money, okay? So the, the question you should ask the adjuster is when does the clock start ticking for the period of restoration? Because you don't want a surprise. Eight, nine months later, all of a sudden you get the letter in the mail says, based on our calculations, we paid you X. You should have done X by now. You've got one more month left and then you're done. So and now you're paying, for those of you that have a mortgage and you're paying rent, it's not, it's not a good s s scenario to be in. Yes? What about buying an RV or a trailer to live in on your property? Mm -hmm. Will the insurance companies pay for the full amount if it's reasonable, like a 40000 that you stay in for two years and it comes out to 1700 a month or something? Versus? Yeah, I mean, I've seen plenty of people doing that, especially down in the Elks, uh, right? The Elks side, they have a whole, whole trailer um, uh, set up there. Motor homes, I've seen people buying motor homes. The question I would have is, do I get to keep it? Do I get to keep it after? So you have a hard asset at the end of this whole process. So it, and you can sell it yeah. if you want. So if I'll just touch base. So a lot of it depends on your insurance company. Uh, we've had issues with State Farm down in Big Sur where people couldn't find homes. And, of course, State Farm would say, well, we'll, we'll pay to rent it for you. Because when you buy it, you get the asset and State Farm will say, well, look, we're entitled to the salvage value. So it really depends on the carrier. I, I personally, I mean, it's penny wise, pound foolish, because if you think about it, you're probably saving them, 
you know, ten, twenty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Right. Um, and so you just have to get to the right person at State Farm, get the right uh, player, um, and then you know you can always do a lease option. You know, uh, maybe the lease is X amount, but the the owner of the uh, RV agrees to you know give you a reduced price to buy it out. I'm hearing some different things here. We have State Farm also. We've been around with them about, about this loss of use thing. Okay, I'm hearing people owning RVs and they're getting paid by their carriers for loss of use. Mm -hmm. I heard about somebody in Santa Rosa that you mentioned forming an LLC and putting the property that they own and renting it back to themselves. Is right. that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. What if I put my pl I have a little place over in Trinity County that's a little under a thousand square feet. What if I put that in S corporation and rented it back to myself? What's the difference? Uh, I, it's an I don't, entity. I, I don't see an issue. Let me ask you a question. What if you just said to State Farm, hey, I've got this property. I periodically rent it out anyway. <laughs> do you, do you rent We've it? been that route. Okay. And the jester down here had it all figured out in terms of loss of use, the deal about replacing your standard of living and all that, turned it in, thumbs down from up top. They said because, no. Because you, because you don't typically because rent it out? Is that we what do on occasion, not on a regular basis. We've, uh, we've uh, put it up for auction for well, private owners. What were organs. you planning to rent it out? Was it an issue that the 1,000 square foot property over there rents for a lot less than what it would be here? Sure. And, and, and did you ask to rent it this rate? Because that may be an issue that they may say, look, you're charging way more than what the rent mar rental market would be for that property over there. And which I could see them doing that. And then I'd say, okay, but you're going to pay me for my miles back and forth because I got to deal with the reconstruction. I got to deal with work. Then you'd be entitled to collect for that. Well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go there on anything. And they just said no, period. State Farm. <laughs> Um, well, we've got a few minutes left. I want to be respectful of, of time. We one have a more, question. One more question. Just really quick. Um, the loss of use, I'm understanding it as anything that I've purchased to, like, just to get back on my feet. Like, just, you know, you don't have anything, you know. And right. so, like, I've been keeping receipts of everything we've been buying, you know, for the dogs, for us. Mm -hmm. Is that considered that money? Because yeah. it's not replacing my pr private property. I mean, that stuff's gone. And so I'm going to still, that personal belonging stuff, I'll still get that money. But then shouldn't they also reimburse me for just the loss of use? Because I've lost the use of all of those things, so right? Or is it? It's, it's, a good question. Not, it's a good question. So you're going out and you're buying personal property because you need something to wear, et cetera. The carrier could make an argument you're replacing your personal property. It's not loss of use. And I, I don't want to get into too many details. I've justified sometimes where uh, someone's an executive and uh, they don't have time to go out and replace their wardrobe. And the day after the fire, they go to Kmart and they just buy a bunch of sweatpants, etc. Sometimes I've argued with the carrier, hey, look, this is emergency clothing. It's not what they typically wear but we'll deduct out 50% for salvage value uh, and pay us the difference under additional living expense. That's the scenario where you can do that. But typically, what additional living expenses is, it's additional expenses to maintain your standard of living. If you have to board the dogs up, that's an additional living expense. If you, in, in boarding it up, it includes food, the carrier may argue, well, we want a slight reduction because you normally incur food for the dog anyway. It's just at a lesser rate. The, the vet, or not the vet, but the boarding kennel place charges you more. It's the additional expenses above and beyond. You go out and you rent a house, but there's no fence and you had a fence before. I'd argue, and we've done this before, where the carrier should pay for a temporary fence to be placed so that your dogs can roam without you know, roaming off the property, because that's what you had before. Does that help answer? Okay. Oh. 
Good. That's yeah, and that, and that makes sense. You know, uh, you're entitled to have a comparable living situation than what you had. And yes, I've even had, and it took a long time with State Farm, but my, our client, they went ahead, they got this place. They, it was Santa Rosa. You couldn't even find houses. They got something, but it had no window coverings. And so we did get State Farm to pay for window coverings, even though it became part of the property of the owner renting it, we got it paid. M moving forward, uh, who can represent you? This comes up a lot. Attorneys, sure, they can. If you have a coverage issue, you don't have a legal issue here, you have a valuation issue, okay? So oftentimes we hear, oh, I'm gonna call my attorney and all of a sudden, you know, they'll, they'll get involved. And what happens is the minute you do that, the minute an insurance carrier or the adjuster gets a, a notice from an attorney, he's got to hand it over to the legal department because now it's, it's, it's the whole scenario changed. It kind of slows the process down. You know, attorneys don't roll up their sleeves, sit down with you and, and create a list of inventory. They don't measure the, you know, the, the property. Maybe they can manage it, uh, but they're not preparing a claim to, to be able to negotiate it. Um, so, but they can represent you. Public adjusters, sure. We're licensed, we're bonded state to state by the Department of Insurance to represent your interest in the preparation and negotiation of a claim. Contractors, that's a no-no. They cannot represent you in the negotiation. You need a special license. There was a sting operation back in, was it Paradise? Yeah. Chico so. Firestorm, that happened a few years ago. The DOI, there was predatory practices going on. The contractors were swo swooping in, saying, oh, don't, you don't need those guys, you don't need attorneys, you don't need public adjusters, just hire us. We'll, we'll get, come up with the numbers and we'll negotiate it for you. They got bagged and put in jail. So that's a no-no, okay? Contractors cannot, uh, they can certainly write your bid or an estimate to figure out what, what, uh, what it would cost for you to rebuild your house, but they cannot uh, negotiate with your carrier. Insurance agents and brokers, uh, no longer they used to be able to. Uh, so Senate law, uh, uh, Senate law, I forgot the number, 433 passed. What is it? Thank you, Richard. Uh, Senate Bill 488 passed uh, January of 2017 that no longer uh, <clears throat> has them able to negotiate on your behalf. The agent sells you the policy. The broker sells the policy. They're nothing more than an extension of the insurance company. So how can you have your agent go to the insurance company, which he gets paid by, say, hey, you're not paying them enough money. They can't do it. It's a conflict of interest. Okay. Any questions on this? I would just add that, uh, you know, every public adjuster is required to uh, have a licensing exam. And it's the same exam that insurance adjusters take, except one caveat. Most of these insurance adjusters that work for State Farm or Allstate, they're not licensed. It's the parent person. It's the manager or the managerial level where they get licensed. So Good they question. don't even have to take the same exam we have unless you're an independent. Independent adjusters have to be licensed. Question. Yeah. <clears throat> now, you said contractors. I would imagine that if someone like Service Master or Service Pro came in there and gave you a bid on cleaning stuff from smoking and contamination, um, you, they can't negotiate with your insurance adjusters, but um, when they, they put their estimate of what needs to be clean versus the insurance companies, can, uh, do, do the insurance companies work with these guys? Yeah, they're, they're basically a preferred vendor. They're, they're a franchise. They're, in, you know, they're like right, McDonald's. Right. So, so, but they can't sit there and, and argue, well, they can't they, negotiate. They can't but, negotiate or argue scope. You gave a, ga a good example, the duck work. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah. I'm getting to. Um, and, and, you know, the adjuster's just saying, well, we don't cover it or we don't think it's necessary. Uh, I agree. I think it's absolutely necessary. But technically, they could say, we're not going to listen to them. Or if they don't like their pricing, they can say, well, we've got our own internal pricing. Now, that's where, you know, you as a homeowner should say, look, Show me someone who can do it for that because ser service master is telling me it can't be done for that. Well, it's not that. They, they, the price thing is just that they're, not, they're just going to clean the registers and not the ducts. And I'm going, right. I'm not going to buy that. So, but you, I, Service I need, master can't make that argument with the carrier. 
it can or cannot. I have to make it. You have to make it because they're they're now <coughs> you know doing right. public adjusting. Uh, they're not licensed. To right. No. No. I get that. Claim. I get that, okay. and that's why that's a good thing you mentioned that. I'm just saying is that basically I'm going to have to be, if I can't afford an attorney, I'm going to have to be my own. You don't have a legal issue. You have a valuation issue. Right. It's not illegal. Yeah. Not, it's so a, I have to give in to the the insurance company. No. Look, what I would do if it was my home, I'd have a swab test done on the ductwork, and if it just shows particulate, there's your proof. Yeah. Done. And then they have to do it. Well, yes. yeah. You, yeah. Because yeah. you got you said you have uh, of asthma. Or something? Yeah, asthma. Me, and my son. You know they're going to get sued for liability issues. So have, you, do you want to spend it? Now yeah, they're they're aware of that too. Because right. I told them that's why we had to move out. Right. I would do the swab thing. Just have yeah. have service master go in with well, a chem sponge, swab the they, inside. They all did that already. Did but it show a positive I, with particular? Ev evidently, yeah. Then don't but, get rid of the evidence. Submit it. Say this is your proof. You owe me the money, or get it done. Period. They'll always, you know, look, everything's a negotiation with an insurance company. Okay. Everything. Okay. They never give you their best and final offer up front. So be prepared. Again, the caveat to that is if you're grossly underinsured, you're going to negotiate a claim. The only thing I would add to that is, uh, you know, we get a lot of phone calls from people that have smoke damage and they're running up into very similar situations as you. Uh, they, just how far do you go? I get a lot of calls from people that have asthma or other health issues go to your doctor get them to write a note good point write a medical That's note where put I it in going. the file and make sure you're putting the insurance company on notice that look i'm giving you all the information you need to get this done you're choosing not to do it you're putting our health at risk yeah good point <clears throat> and, good and i was i knew kyle's going to go there question and here, kyle? i just beforehand i want to also add to your example um besides the doctor's note you can have service master you know say hey we wiped it there you want to get an actual hygienist to come in and do a, a certified test that shows that there is carbon in the duct work and that way you know it's done the right way and i i don't think the carrier will have any other choice but to get the ducts what, what about the insulation in your attic and outside walls <laughs> that's going to smell how do you you can't clean it well, you can you can do testing up in the attic as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I would. We have a question here. How much do you charge? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we typically work on uh, ten cents on the dollar, ten percent. We work on ten percent from dollar one of what's collected. What I would what I would recommend is if it makes sense to uh, have a one-on-one -on -one meeting and we sit down, we look at your policy, we have a conversation about where you're at what's been paid, where you need to get to. And if it makes sense to get involved, folks, we'll show you where. We want to add value to the process. We don't want to take away uh, value. So if, there's, if the policy is a, a policy that would allow us to add value because you know, the numbers look right, we'll tell you, we'll show you. If, and we'll be the first to tell you that we, we can't get involved. It just doesn't make sense. But we'd be happy to share the information with you. That's what I would recommend. We're meet, having meetings every day with families and there's no cost, by the way, there's no obligation. And what it does is it allows you to get kind of more one-on-one -on -one with us to really zero in, because your issues are different than his. And everybody's got different end games here, whether you rebuild. So that's what I would recommend, but it is 10 cents on the dollar. And on average, we're, we average typically, because we track the metrics, anywhere between 20 to 80% more uh, greater recovery than you'll get on your own. And we take it off your plate. We take all the burden of proving it off your plate. It's handled professionally. All the carriers know us. We're the 800-pound gorilla out there, west of Arizona. And they know us. You know, so we, we hold their feet to the fire, and we make them pay it. If they owe it, they owe it. And we can show them why they owe it. So we create a defendable document. Typically, great question. How long does it take? Typically, on average, 90 to 120 days is the lifespan of a claim. And it depends on how, um, how much time you have to sit down with us to recreate the list. So we work at your pace. We know you're busy. If it's nights or weekends, we make those appointments in our teams. But typically, it takes about 90 to 120 days or so to, to um, prepare, present, and negotiate. Yeah. I was just going to add, we don't get paid till you get paid. Right. So it's in our best interest to expedite this. We just want to make sure, I mean, you've saw packages, and by the way, I, I passed out a building claim as well, and you see the detail. Um, 
Our experience is if it takes an extra month longer, but it gets us an extra $100,000, it's worth it. So it's all about documenting it and detailing it and then presenting it. And what we really like to do, and we talk about this, is we do like to get involved in the beginning earlier on because ultimately that building estimate or that personal property claim, it's about being proactive. We don't want the carrier putting numbers together. Right. We want them reviewing our numbers. It's a lot easier to get them from here and maybe they get us down a little bit than it is for their numbers down here. We're way up here and getting them to come up. It's a lot harder. It's, it's easy to you know, pull out the small stuff. Uh, it's a lot harder to get the big dollars. Yeah. Yes? Question? Are you guys th um, there through the rebuilding process as far as like if we don't want the same floor plan, if we want to change things up, I mean, negotiating? Look, with first the of all, with or without us, you, you're not obligated to rebuild it the way it was. All the, the only thing you're obligated to do if you have that extended replacement cost coverage is to show you spent the money. Now, what typically happens is as good of a job as we do, and we do a very good job because we get paid on making sure you collect every single penny, things come up during the rebuild. A code provision that no one was aware of that you now have to comply with. Or something was missed. We forgot about uh, a light fixture or something like that. There was a supplemental we yep. added. Or, by the way, or construction costs are higher because you're now six months later. We, and we didn't talk about it, but that's another thing to talk about. Demand Santa surge. Rosa, demand surge, 30% or more reconstruction costs were 30% higher. I, I wanna answer your question. Uh, the, we become an extension of you, or we're a team. And if your goal is this road here, we're the vessel to get you to that end goal. And there's, again, everybody's scenario is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can lean on us, we're available pretty much 24-7. Uh, so if there's a, remember what affects our clients affects us too. So we'll create a, a claim management plan, uh, you know, together and then we implement that. So, so we're with you through the whole process. Okay, and one thing I wanted to point out too that we have found out if you are rebuilding and you rebuild the house that you had prior, you are able to maintain your Prop 13 property taxes. taxes? Oh yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, if you make, if it changes or goes down, then it changes your house and it changes, you get reassessed. Yeah. But I don't, it, does it, do they reassess you if you build a smaller home? They can. Okay. Because you are changing what you had prior. And if it's okay. changing, then it gets reassessed. If you're building approximately the same footprint, same square footage, from my understanding, yeah. you um, get to maintain your Prop 13 taxes. Some counties I know will sometimes allow you to add an extra 5% or 10% right. without getting that new assessment, or they just assess you on that 10%. I'm just sharing that. Uh, what's really important, which just brought up, is I hope everyone knows to go to your tax assessor and let them know you have zero value now uh, on your improvements, so you won't be paying property taxes other than what you pay on the land. Then um, go get your debris permit, your um, de yeah. demolition permit, because then you pre preserve that square footage and it will be a selling point when you go to sell the lot. Good point. Mm -hmm. That's so a really you, good point. Yeah, then you don't have to pay I school not, impact yeah. fees or development fees. That's great. Yep. I did not know that. That's great news. We're going to share that with our people. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you so much for, for the great questions. Uh, we're going to hang around. Yeah, we're available to answer any questions. Uh, it's late. Um, one of the things that we do do is we're more than happy to meet with you. Again, some people need us, some people don't, but you'll, you'll be smarter after you get done meeting with us. Okay. Yes. What do you mean? Um, I'm, not, I'm a little unclear on the question. P 
pay the limits? Uh, sure, State Farm was one of them. No, right. Not right away. Not right away, <laughs> right. No, no, I mean, you have to still present a claim. Now, what right. happened was some people uh, with a lot of pressure politically, and we handled about 300 of the firestorm victims up there, but, you know, we told them the right to their Congress. It, it changed. Like, initially it was 30%. Uh, they went up to 50% advances. They didn't settle claims. They just issued more monies up front in, a, in an effort. And some of them issued 75% because they figured, you know, if we give them 75% without having to do an inventory, oh, they'll walk away. And some people did. But for those people that had losses way more than that, and there were a lot, you know, the people that we, we were, that retained us, Many of them, they didn't want to walk away from a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars in personal property, and they got it all. Most people don't realize what they have. If you think you have three hundred thousand dollars in personal property, you probably have four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, and to answer your question, unless you're grossly underinsured, where you've suffered an eight hundred thousand dollar loss and you only have, you know, three hundred thousand all in, you should get paid. Yes. I mean, so that. You're, but for those of you that have the proper amounts. You have to prepare a claim, present it, negotiate yes. it, and settle it properly. Yeah. They hope you go away with a good advance. Some people. And by the way, it sounds like you may be on, you know, grossly underinsured on your personal, on personal property. property you, then, don't, right? you don't need someone like us. Good. Yeah. Add an extra 30 to 60 days, just yep. be prepared. But again, I think the strategy for you would be if you can bring up the fact that it's double m of my limit, maybe that'll fly faster. Yeah, you may want to, what you should do is, uh, what they've given you, 30% so far of your contents. You know, maybe say, look, please talk to your management, see if you can get me another 30% more. We're way over our limit and see what they do. You may be able to get more money. It's just you have the money available for things come sooner. Again, thanks. Thank you so much. We'll be up here if you have any further questions. Thanks for coming out, guys. Thank you.